as we bow in prayer, I know that we have people out ill. I know we have people who have lost family members. Uh, I understand that Rene Zambrano is not here this morning because his father is not doing well. So we want to remember Rene and his father in our prayers today. And I'm, I know there are, are many others, but I would invite you to bow your heads with me this morning as we go before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for your assurance that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and because of our faith, that you have given us righteousness. We pray, dear Lord, this morning that you will be with us, that you will send your spirit to be with this congregation, to also be with our family members and our other members who are not here today. We hold up uh, Rene Zambrano in particular this morning and his father pray that you will be with them and give them comfort and give them courage. Be with our members who are ill. Continue to give hope and courage to the Russell family as they continue to deal with their loss. Dear Lord, as we open your word this morning, we claim the promise from James that we have not because we ask not. So now we are asking that your spirit be with us, that it fill us, that it be with Etienne as he brings your message to us this morning, that you will speak through him and that you will today replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh, that we might be receptive to your spirit as we worship you in this place this morning. For all these things we pray in your name. This thing's a little weird. I'm still not used to what it feels like on my ears because normally I just use this one. But we'll put this one down and we'll see how this one does for me. Well, I delivered this sermon last week at the Rogers Church, and when we had an emergency, pastor called and said, I hear you are prepared. Would you please step in? So here I am. Um, our scripture this morning is found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And this is what it says. Paul's writing to the people in Galatia, and he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let's bow our heads as we go into God's Word. Father Job, in chapter 40, verse 4, said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Woe, for I am undone, for I am of unclean lips. Peter said in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Lord, go away from me because I'm a sinful man. And Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the chief. Now, Lord, if Job and Isaiah, Peter and Paul can speak of themselves in that way, what can I say about myself this morning? Lord, I call upon your mercy because you're a merciful God. You make your son to rise on the evil and the good, on the just and the unjust. I stand in your presence this morning. Help me, Father. Tell me what to say and how to say it. 
I ask that you will bring your spirit in here to unite our hearts as one. I ask that you will bless your sons and daughters in your presence this morning. Cleanse them from sin, Father, because nothing confuses the truth more than sin. Lord, we've had a lot of people that have been sick, and we thank you, and we praise your name for the recovery that they've experienced. We also still have more people that are sick, and we ask that you would bring your healing hand to overshadow them. Lord, there's been some that have lost loved ones, and we ask that you would comfort them. Hear this prayer of mine this morning, Father. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We reap what we sow. Can we expect a crop if we have not prepared the soil and planted seed? Can we expect for anything to germinate that we have not sown? Absolutely not. This law should govern everything that we do. It should reward us proportionally to our efforts exerted. But we know this life is not fair, and on this planet, that law does not always operate optimally. But we know of one place in the universe where this law works perfectly, and that is in God's court. What you sow, the Bible says, you will reap in the end. God is always fair. John, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus addresses the Pharisees. And he tells them that don't marvel at this because a time will come when the graves will open and some will be resurrected to receive the reward of eternal life. Others will be resurrected and receive the reward of eternal destruction. We sow and we reap what we sow. Only two choices. Only two groups of people emerge at the end of this, this world and at the end of each generation. Those who belong to Jesus and those who are Satan's property. As Adventists, we are very familiar with end time events. If you think of end time events, what comes to mind? Tell me. What comes to mind? If you hear an Adventist say, end time events, what are you thinking about? Mark of the beast, trouble, persecution, Jesus coming. The list goes on, am I right? These are all events that we anticipate in the near future. If you think about organizations that are involved in the end times, what comes to mind? One should pop out right from the beginning as Adventists. The papacy, am I right? We talk about all the secret societies, the Masons and Illuminati, and all these organizations come to mind that play a role in the end times. End time events and end time organizations. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy what we can expect the end time church to look like. He says... It will experience perilous times. And it's not perilous because of what the Pope is doing or what the Illuminati is doing. It is what's going on inside the church that makes it perilous times. Because what we see will not be as it appears. The problem in the end. A large portion of the church will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the transforming power of God in their lives. All too often we are focused on end time, events, and organizations. And that's okay, because it's important to know what's going on around us. But salvation is a personal matter. We are not saved because of what someone else has done, or we're lost because of what someone else has done. We stand before God's throne by ourselves, and we are judged based upon what we personally have done in our lives. 
These are perilous times because I believe Satan is diverting the attention of God's end time church away from matters of the heart to place it on what's going on around us. Whether we're conscious or unconscious about the fact, we are preparing to be either sealed by God or to be marked by Satan. We have our timetables and our countdown calendars, and we check off the events as they happen. But all too often we forget that we live in perilous times, and we are preparing for the end by the choices we make each and every day. Only two harvests. Revelation 14 talks about two harvests. The harvests, the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the grapes. We will be in one of those two. Remember at the end, things will not be the way they appear to be. This morning, I want you to reason with me through the Bible because we want to take a closer look at what is God's seal. How does God mark his people in the end? We've asked the Holy Spirit to guide us, and he said he would guide us in truth. He's the one that penned this book through inspiration, and he will guide us on our journey to discover truth. Why is it important to have the truth about the seal of God? Well, we make decisions based upon facts. And if we have the wrong facts, it will affect the way we decide. So we must uncover the truth this morning. What is God's seal? Can we biblically say that the seal of God is the Seventh-day Sabbath and the mark of the beast is Sunday sacredness. How firm is our biblical foundation when we make statements like those? Is honoring one day over the other all that's involved? The choices we make before this final decision will be determined upon the choices we've made leading up to the final decision. We will discover, as I said, only two groups that are and ever will be in this world, those who belong to Jesus and those who are the property of the arch deceiver, Satan. Five questions I want to look at this morning. We need to find scriptural evidence or answers for five questions. Why does God need to seal these people? Number two, when does he seal them? How does he seal them? And then we'll know what God's seal is. What is it? What is God's seal? And then at the end, what assurance can I have that Jesus is trying to seal me? Very important. Why does God need to seal these people? Who have, who have you been to a boarding academy? What did you do to your things before you left home? Did you mark them? You, why did you mark them? It identified the owner of the pair of socks, the pair of underwear, whatever it was, so that you'd be able to identify your property from other people's property. God does the same thing. And I got way too many verses for you have to look them all up. So in Job chapter 1 verse 8, Satan comes to God and while the sons of God met up in heaven, and God asked Satan, he said, have you seen my servant, Job? So God has property here. He says Job is his servant. We know when Adam and Eve sinned, property rights of this world was transferred temporarily from Jesus to Satan. But we all are not stuck being Satan's because it did not remove our ability to choose. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, Paul says that we have been bought with a price. 
1 Peter 1 tells us that we have not been redeemed with corruptible things. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. So Jesus has come down and he has bought those who want to be bought back. 2 Timothy 2, 19, Paul says, God knows his own. There's one more reason why God marks his people. 1 John 2, verse 1, says that God, um, that we have an advocate with the Father. So when a judgment comes up in heaven, does Jesus represent every one of the people that ever lived on this world? No. Who does he represent? Only the ones that are his. Those who have asked him to step in as their attorney. Those are the ones that he marked as his own. His own property he stands up for them in a judgment. So all those who have professed Christ in the world are not Christians in a real sense of the word. Millions of people have been slaughtered by other Christians in the world. And as a whole, Christianity be, has been a terrible witness for Christ in this world. We know that everyone who claims Christ is not a Christian. Some are forgeries and fakes. They're Christian only in a sense of the word, and they have to tell you they're one, because you can't see that from the way they act. Jesus says not everyone who calls him Lord, Lord in the end will be saved. He knows who are his children. We don't. So we know he seals us to show the rest of the universe that we belong to him. When does he do this? As a general rule, Advent and Adventist theology says that God seals people at the very end of time. But I want to show you a few scriptures this morning that might want you to think along different lines. The Bible talks about three parts to the sealing. It talks about a historical sealing. It talks about a present sealing. And it talks about an eschatological sealing. So our most favorite passage to go to when we talk about the sealing is Revelation chapter 7, where it talks about the seal of God being placed on the foreheads of God's servants. It's talking about what, in what tense about the sealing. In a future tense, am I right? This is the eschatological point of the sealing. But in Ezekiel chapter 9, we also have a ceiling. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 9. While you're finding it, Ezekiel is sitting at his house in Babylon. He has been taken there captive. And he's wandering in his mind what is God going to do with the remnant left over in Jerusalem? Is God going to save them? What is going to happen to them? And then God takes Ezekiel and vision back to Jerusalem. And in chapter 8, he shows him what the people are doing over there. And he lists all these abominations. Women worshiping at the north gate of the temple, worshiping Tammuz. Elders and leaders of the people standing with their back to the temple, worshiping the rising sun. And it's as if God is asking Ezekiel, if you were in my shoes, what would you do with this bunch? Would you save them? And so now chapter 9 continues. <clears throat> Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Now verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house, 
And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare and you shall show no pity. God said, Whoa, before I send in the destroy destroyers, mark my people. So this sealing happens in the past. It's in a historical setting. It's something that's already taken place. But it can also be seen as a sealing that's taking presently because it's happening as Ezekiel is in vision. He sees it happening right in front of his eyes. So we have three parts of a sealing, historical, present, and a future. Now, in Revelation 7 and Ezekiel 9, there's something interesting that happens. <clears throat> the sealing takes place right before what? Judgment on the wicked, okay? And we'll see that there are two kinds of sealings. There's a sealing that is general and generational, and there's a special sealing. Now, I believe the people that are sealed, the 144,000 that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7 and 14, they already sealed. God already knows they're his children. The same thing happened to the people in Ezekiel's time. This is a special sealing that protects the people from the judgments that will fall on the wicked shortly. Special sealing, special protection from God. He says, I'm going to judge the wicked, but I'm going to protect you, especially you're my child. You're not going to be touched. So we see this happening throughout the Bible. We see it in Genesis chapter 6. Now Genesis 6 does not tell us that God sealed anybody, but he tells Noah in verse 18 and 19 that he's going to destroy the whole world. He has marked everything that has the breath of life in it. He's marked them to be destroyed. So if they're marked, then no one, his family must have been marked also not to participate in the destruction. So I think safely we can make the assumption that God had sealed no one, his family, and the other people were marked for destruction. We also see this happening in Exodus chapter 12, with the preparation leading up to the death angel coming. God told Moses, I have marked every firstborn in Egypt to be killed. But we know not every firstborn died. Why was that? Well, some were marked by the blood on the doorposts. And a death angel passed over. So the same thing happened. We can see throughout the Bible, we can see that God has a special sealing for the people, his people living when judgments on the wicked will fall. So a special sealing. It's a generational sealing also because, a general generational sealing because if you look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, God tells Noah, I have seen that you are righteous in your generation, in this generation. So I believe when we look at the Bible, we can see that God is actively sealing people throughout each generation. It is not something that just happens at the very end. Noah was faithful in his generation. Abraham was faithful in his generation. Isaac and his, Jacob and his, Joseph and his. We can go down the list. God has always had faithful people, and I believe he's always marked them for salvation. They're his. The righteous are his. They belong to him. If God does that, how does he do it? That's our third question. How does God seal his people? Ephesians chapter 1. Go with me this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. 
And I like the way the New Living Translation put it, so I'm reading from it. Most of the other verses I have read from the English Standard Version. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, the identified, this is what the New Living Translation says, the King James says sealed instead of identified, you as he's owned by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. According to Paul, the Holy Spirit is what seals us. How does this work? He's addressing the Gentiles here. He first addressed, addra addressed the Jews. Now he's addressing the Gentiles in verse 13. And he says, we as Gentiles, we've heard the gospel. Prompted by the Spirit, we respond and we believe that Jesus will save us. We also believe because of that, that we will inherit eternal life. As a result of our faith in his ability to perform what he's promised, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee or as a down payment for the promises that he's yet to fulfill. He develops this concept a little further in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And there Paul writes and he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul says the Holy Spirit seals us, identifies us as God's property. How does he do that? How does the Spirit identify us as God's children? Jesus said that we will know people by their fruit. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, and the list goes on. If you go to verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 4, you will see that Paul spells out the transformative power of the Spirit of God living in our lives. He says, do not continue to live the lives you used to live. The New Living Translation puts verse 23 like this. Instead of living the life you used to live, he said, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Then he goes on and he says, if you lie, stop lying. If you're a thief, stop stealing, work with your hands. Don't let your anger control you. Don't use abrasive language. Build people up. Don't tear them down. He says, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all evil behavior. See, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is supposed to transform us. You change our hearts and minds so that we will want to be obedient to God. Chapter 4 ends with verse 32. And Paul says, instead of all this bad behavior, the list above, instead, be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. John chapter 14 is a very special chapter. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. And he tells them, I'm leaving you, but I'm not going away forever. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I'm done, I'm coming back to get you. But while I'm gone, I am not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you a helper that will always be with you. In verse 17, it says this, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him though, 
for he dwells with you and in you. The Spirit is our guarantee of eternal life. It's what Paul tells us. Because we can start living eternal life now by stop lying, all those things that he said in Ephesians chapter 4. God seals, so we've seen to this point that God seals the people that belongs to him. We've seen that God seals us with his Holy Spirit. That's how he seals us. So if he seals us with the Spirit, what is he seal? Now, one thing to remember when we study God's Word is we always have to remember the context. We have to put ourselves back into the position of the person that wrote in order to make heads or tails of what they're trying to say. Things that they reference and talk about might be conceptually different from what we think of when we hear the same terms today. So we have to keep that in mind. So when John talks about the seal being given in Revelation chapter 7, we have to think of what John was thinking about. What was he imagining when he was talking about the seal? Go with me to Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. Revelation 7, verse 3. To do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. <clears throat> so where is the seal placed? On the forehead. Does it tell us anything about the seal? No, it just says God puts a seal on the forehead. Revelation 14 gives us more detail. Verse 1, Revelation 14, 1. He said, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So now we have more information. God's seal partly has to do with the name of Jesus and the name of the Father. That is what's in their forehead. Now, now we have to put our Hebrew thinking caps on. Did names in the Bible have significance? So obviously the ones that God marks with his seal receive a new name because there's a name now written in their forehead. It's a different name. Most famous name change is probably Jacob, am I right? When we go to Genesis 32, we'll see that Jacob wrestled there with the angel. He's scared for his life because Esau is coming to kill him and everything that belongs to him. And he wrestles with God that night. And before God lets him go, Jacob says, you got to bless me. And so how did God bless him? He said, your name will not be called Jacob any longer. It will be called Israel from now on. Because as a prince of God, you have wrestled with God and man. And you have overcome. A name change is also promised to two of the seven churches. Pergamos and Philadelphia. And the condition for the change in name is still the same as it was for Jacob. They received the name change because they overcame. So if the seal of God changes who I am, how does the Sabbath change me? We like to say, 
The seal of God is the seventh day Sabbath. So if that's true, how does the Sabbath change me? Can it change me? So let's look. What does Jesus say? He says, John 13, 35, he says, Hereby will all men know that you are my disciples if you go to church on my Sabbath day. Is that what it says? No, he doesn't say that. He says, everyone will know you're my disciple by the way you treat others. So the seal of God is much broader than the Sabbath. Now, is the Sabbath part of it? Obviously so. Because in that whole principle of love, the Sabbath is part of it. But it's not the only part. So when I receive the seal of God through his spirit, his spirit leaves a permanent imprint in me of Jesus' character. That's how the Holy Spirit seals us. It's part of the new covenant promise. In Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God said that he'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. He will give them a new heart. They will give him a new mind. He will write his laws on their heart. Ellen White makes a statement that when Lucifer rebelled, the angels were surprised that God had a law. You see, the only reason why we have a law is because we don't know how to love. Someone has to tell us what love looks like. When we operate within the principle of love, there is no law. So if we love like Jesus, no one has to tell us how to love people. There's no law that forces a mom to feed her baby. There's no law that forces a mom to get up in the middle of the night to change the baby's diaper. There is no such law. Because the mom, any decent mom, let me qualify, any decent mom will get up with her child, and any decent dad will help the mom. <laughs> anyway, I'm meddling now. Uh, so the principle of love will govern us. Because think about it. In heaven, there is not going to be a law that says don't commit adultery. There is not going to be a law that says honor your father and your mother. Many of those laws won't exist. Why? Because we're going to be operate within the principle that governs those rules, which is love. So God's love, and so let me, let me read this to you. I think this is a, it's a devotional that, that Ellen White wrote. She makes these statements about the seal of God. <clears throat> In the faith I live by, she says this. She said, the seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a likeness of Christ in character. Now she goes back to John's day with her example that she uses. She says, as wax takes on the impression of the seal, so the soul is to take the impression of the Spirit of God and retain the image of Christ. That's a mouthful. Let me, let me read that again. As wax takes on the impression of the seal, so the soul is to take the impression of the Spirit of God and retain the image of Christ. It's obedience to the principles of the commandments of God that molds the character after the divine similitude. Then she comments in the Bible commentary on Revelation chapter 7, verse 2, and she says, It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. The impression in the wax will set up for eternity 
two people trying to make an imprint in your mind. Devil and Jesus. The question is, whose imprint will you take? In the end, only two groups. So scripturally, I think we're safe when we can say that the seal of God includes the Sabbath, but it is not the Sabbath. It is Christ's character duplicated in our lives. Can other people tell we are Christians by the way we treat them? Or are there people out in the world that will have nothing to do with God because of what we've done to them? We can have two influences. An influence that's holy and uplifting or an influence that is for the bad. Leaving a bad taste of Christianity in the mouths of people. Now if you think of your own life, you probably feel like I do. And as I'm not worthy to say that Jesus has left his imprint on me yet. But there's hope for all of us because if you look at all the people through the ages that we know have been marked as Christ's, none of them were perfect either. God saves Noah. Was Noah faithful after the flood? No. God saves, God picks Abraham and he says, you righteous before me? Was Abraham faithful all the time? No, he wasn't. The list goes on. Even Paul prays in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he says, Lord, please take this thorn out of my flesh. And what's God's response? My grace is sufficient for you, because when you're at your weakest, I show myself strong. So let me leave you with some hope this morning, because God's Word is littered with promises to claim as we live anticipation of Jesus' soon return. Number one, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he will not let you go without a fight. He's constantly working. Romans 5.8 qualifies that statement a little bit more, and it says, he died for us while we were yet Sinners. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Jesus invites anyone who is weary of walking this life on this planet. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. And then he promises in John 6, 37, that if we come, he won't chase us away. He'll say, come to me. He'll accept us the way we are. So the choice is ours because Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus is knocking on the door of each one of our hearts. And if we open the door, the promise to Jeremiah and Ezekiel about the new heart he'll give us, he'll fulfill that in us. He'll give us a new, word, a new heart. Very nice promise is found in John chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, if you're in my hand and in my father's hand, no one is strong enough to pluck you out of there. You can leave by yourself, but no one can pull you out of here. Jesus says, I can sympathize with your failures because my grace is sufficient. When you're weak, I am strong. He says in Philippians 1 verse 6, that I'm the one who started the job in you, and I only do good jobs. I'll finish it. His strength shines through us because it is God who works in us. Philippians 2 verse 13. To will and to do of his own good pleasure. Don't despair. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The one who saves to the uttermost who come to him and who provides the strength to conquer anything. Our choices have eternal consequences, not just for us, but sometimes for others as well. 
We are God's ambassadors on this planet, and often I wonder how well I represent Him. Developing a Christ-like character takes time. It will not happen just with a final decision to pick between one day or the other. If you're waiting for that time to make your decision, you're going to be too late. We will not be able to blame the Pope or anybody else if we're lost in the end. Now, although we think the little decisions are inconsequential that we make each and every day, we are building characters, ripening for one or the other harvest. The little decisions we make daily will determine how we choose in the end. Sooner or later, going back to the wax and the seal, sooner or later, that wax sets up. And that imprint is permanent, cannot be changed. Thank goodness, through God's grace, the wax stays soft for a long time. <laughs> you know? Thank goodness it's not the quick set. But the question is, is who will sign your forehead? Who will take ownership of you? Will it be God or Satan? It's not good enough in the end just to have a form of godliness. God's Spirit must be the transforming influence in our lives. Two groups in the end. Our scripture said we get what we deserve. We reap what we've sown. Both groups are delivered. One, one group, Jesus people, they're delivered from the seven last plagues and the destruction of the earth. The other group is delivered to receive. So my prayer for you this morning is that I hope that all of us will be part of those who have been signed sealed and will be delivered with Jesus and all the faithful through all the ages to meet together on the sea of glass in a new kingdom. Amen. It's our heads. Heavenly Father, we're so glad that you are actively working. All three parts of the Godhead are actively working to save us, to sign us, to stamp us with your approval. Lord, when you put your stamp on me, you're saying, he's my boy. He thinks and act like I would. Lord, my prayer is that we can be that example, that we will let your spirit transform us to be like Jesus, is my prayer in his holy name. Amen.